I will present you today the first part of my work, and uh, this is the first part of my pr postdoc project, so feel free to suggest any comments at the end of the presentation. Now, the first time, Monroe, I gave a lecture in front of you, a presentation in front of you, it was two years ago. It was during the Annenberg Oxford um, Institute to summer of 2013. And after I presented my dissertation, uh, which dealt with the power of public complaints and how public complaints, complaints can actually influence the regulator, you approached me and you said to me, well, this was a great presentation, but why didn't you say something about the political situation in Israel? <laughs> So, unfortunately, back then it wasn't a part of my presentation. And, and I'm not going to talk about Netanyahu's speech, unfortunately. However, I will present to you, I will offer to you some insights about the Israeli society, insights which I believe are important in the context of my research. And after the presentation, I will be more than willing to answer any questions you might have about the political future of Israel, Netanyahu's speech, Netanyahu's expense report, Net <laughs> Netanyahu's relationship with the U.S., Netanyahu's uh, just chose the topic. I am more than willing to, to answer everything. Um, just spoiler alert, my answers might be a little bit depressing, so <laughs> take it into consideration when you're asking me that. So going back to actually my work. Um, so what was the beginning of the Digital Rights Advocacy Project? Okay. So as I told you earlier, in my dissertation, my PhD dissertation, I looked at the way public complaints filed with the regulator can actually contribute to the construction of boundaries to the cultural sphere in Israel. Now, the inspiration for this work came after working for four years at the complaint department of the regulator. I worked there, the regulator of the commercial te television in Israel, and I was actually pretty fascinated with those people, with these people that kept on filing complaints against offensive shows they saw on television, and they were so determined to make a difference. They were so determined to make a change. And for them, the only way they could do it was by filing complaints. So after spending their four years, I decided that this is going to be my dissertation. This is going to be the topic for my dissertation. So by the time I finished my dissertation, I started to think, okay, what will be my next project? By then, I knew that it had to involve the following components. It had to involve citizens or civic engagement or citizens' activity. It had to involve issues of media policy because I'm fascinated with the connection between media policy and citizens that try to influence this policy. And I knew that it had to be concerning another medium, no longer the television, no longer the radio, Let's try something else, the internet. But I still had no idea how to bring everything together. What will be the scheme for my next project? And then, one night in front of the television, I saw a really strange commercial. Now, before we will show you this commercial, let me tell you something about what, what, is, what is happening to somebody who works at the complaint department for four years. After working for four years at the complaint department, every time I saw something on television, my immediate thought was, okay, who will complain about it? Why would they complain about it? What was the problem with that? I mean, it became horrible to watch television. It doesn't matter if it was a reality show, a game show, a talk show. All I could think about was what will people complain about? So, I'm going to show you this commercial and we can, let me see if it's working, yay. Okay, so it's in Hebrew. So those of you who do not speak the language might find it difficult to understand, so I will explain to you what you're actually seeing here. Okay, so what you're basically seeing here is a guy whose identity is being stolen by another guy. And the guy who stole his identity, you see this is this one, he's using the victim's identity in order to purchase car, to give away money, um, to take away his apartment. So he's leaving the poor victim guy without a car, without a money, without his apartment, without everything. And at the end of the commercial, this is a commercial by the, by the Ministry of Interior. By the end of the commercial, the anchor announces that in order to prevent such a thing, prevent such a problem, you should obtain, let me see, 
Mm -hmm. I'm trying now. Now, okay. Mm. Okay. So, how to protect yourself from identity theft? Obtain smart documents. Now, why? And I saw this commercial, and I remember sitting there thinking to myself, "This is a really strange commercial." Identity theft is not really a problem in Israel. Now, it's different from the US. In US, it's a serious problem. But in Israel, I mean, yeah, sure, I can lose my identity card, but nobody can use it in order to stole my identity, to steal my identity. Um, I would be more concerned if I would lose my credit card. That would be a serious thing, but not identity theft. So I remember seeing it and thinking to myself, well, somebody will definitely complain about it. But why? And who will do that? So a couple days later, I got an answer for my questions. We received a complaint at the regulator from the Israeli digital right movement. And the movement in its complaint raised two main claims. The first claim against the commercial, right? The first claim that it is a controversial issue. And according to the regulation rules in Israel, you cannot show controversial issue in commercial. The second claim, was that the commercial is misleading to the public. Because in the commercial, it was never said that by obtaining smart documents, ID, and passport, you will also be obligated to register to the biometric database. So this was not the first time I heard of the biometric database, but it was the first time I heard of the movement. And then I knew that I basically found my next research proje project, which is digital rights advocacy and the digital right movement around the world. So before going back to the Israeli case and the biometric database and this really controversial commercial, let me talk to you a little bit about the concept of digital rights. <laughs> so this is still a controversial term, but according to some media scholars, the, we have today a new social identity. This is a global citizen, and the global citizens has these days digital rights. What exactly is the meaning of these digital rights? Well, you have the new rights. You have access to the internet. You have preservation of net neutrality. And you have the old rights, which is basically the modern and classic rights, which are adjusted in human rights, which are adjusted to life in the digital surrounding. And it goes back to issues such as privacy and freedom of expression and right to fair use and consumer rights and right to education. And the list goes on and on and on. It's practically impossible to decide what is truly is a digital right. Now, because of this constant um, disagreement regarding the topic, we see that many, many social actors, that we know are familiar with the world now, the multi-stakeholder approach, many social actors are trying to define and frame these rights. This could be governments and internet corporations, academics and the IT community and lawyers Everybody is trying to understand what is the meaning of these rights. Now, the fact that there is such a disagreement between the different social actors, it also provides an opportunity for other social actors, usually the weaker ones, also to step in and to try to take part in this whole process of defining and framing these rights. And now we're going to this social actors that I'm interested in, which is the civil society organizations. Now, these organizations, practically operate all over the world, in different countries, in the US, in Canada, in Australia, in Europe, in Asia, in everywhere around the world. And what these organizations are trying to do, they're trying to promote computer and internet related civil liberties. Now, these organizations also operate in different levels, in the national and the international level. For example, in the US, we have the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and we have the Center for Democracy and Technology. We also have EPIC and uh, Public Knowledge. In Europe, in Europe, in every country, there is an organization. We have the Digital Gesellschaft in Germany, and we have the, um, big, big brother, the Big Brother Watch in the UK, and we have the EFF in Finland, and we have organizations in Netherlands and France and practically all over the Europe. And in addition to these organizations that operate in the national level, in the, uh, we also have in the EU organizations that operate in the um, regi reg regional 
uh, uh, level. We have, for example, organizations such as State Watch and EDRI, which is the European Digital Rights. Now, EDRI is basically an umbrella organization for 35 civil society organizations and uh, privacy organizations. It is situated in Brussels, so it's part of the EU, and they're taking care of the issue in the regional area. So in addition to that, we also have organizations that operate in the international level, such as Privacy International. And what is interesting about all of these organizations is that they all operate in three different arenas. They are operating in the political and the judicial and the public arenas. They are trying to confront, on the one hand, internet organizations and governments trying to confront them in order to <coughs> change their policy. And on the other hand, they are trying to educate and inform the public about their rights as citizens, about their civil liberties. So over the years, the movement, the organizations began were operating somewhere in the, during the 80s and the 90s. And over the years, they have managed to achieve some success, mainly in the, co in the area of um, copyright, the fair use over copyright law. And they, tr and they managed to not always achieve actual success in their efforts, but at least they managed in raising people's awareness and the awareness of policy makers to the issue of digital rights. So, going back to the aim of my research, I decided that I want to focus on how do civil society organizations contribute to the constructions of citizens' digital rights within a given society. I'm focusing only on the national level for now. So if you remember this scheme, instead of public complaints, we have civil society organizations, the regulators change for internet corporation and governments, and the cultural sphere is transformed into digital rights. I'm still not sure whether this is the right scheme, but this is at least something to start from. And now we're going to the research questions and methodology. Well, I decided to use a case study approach. I'm basically looking at successful campaigns led by civil society organizations all around the world, and I'm trying to analyze their campaigns and their success. Now, it is important to know that I'm searching specific cases in which the campaigns were led by civil society organizations. I want to explore the actual power these organizations might have. And this is why I'm interested specifically in cases of privacy advocacy. Because when it comes to privacy and the right to privacy, the main social actor which is really invested in the concept of privacy is civil society organizations, not uh, governments and not internet corporations. So for each case study, I'm looking at these research questions. Which digital right is the organizations advocating for? How does the organizations promote these rights? And more importantly, what is the meaning of their success? I'm looking at success, I'm taking a very, very narrow definition of success. I'm looking in, in cases in which the success led to an actual change, whether it is a change in, in the laws, whether it is change in the conduct of internet organizations or the conduct of governments. There are not a lot of cases. So far, I managed to find five cases, and I'm still not sure all of them qualify in order for my research. Now, in regard to each case, I'm looking at um, the actions of the organizations. I'm looking at the public discourse that follow, that accompanies their, um, their activities, their actions. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I will conduct interviews with activists as well. This is, I served for the last part also, always. Okay, so now I'm going to the Israeli case. Okay, Israeli case and the Israeli digital rights movement, which is the first case I analyzed because it was close to home, as they say. Okay, so in order to understand a little bit about the Israeli case, here's some background about what is actually going on in Israel about digital rights and internet governance. So we basically have the Ministry of Communication, which is in charge of all the technical aspects of, um, of, the, of, of communication in Israel, and especially the internet. It provides license to suppliers of, int to providers of internet. Uh, he's also advocating for the preservation of net neutrality. I mean, in Israel it goes without saying that it should be net neutrality. Um, and He's not, he's not getting involved in anything that relates to anything of content regulation. I mean, there were some attempts in the past to pass legislations and laws to block certain sites online. 
especially sites about uh, violence, that show violence and children's pornography. But all of these attempts were eventually blocked and there, there isn't really any policy of blocking sites in Israel. That is not to say that mm, sometimes sites can be blocked, but eventually they will return to normal activity. Um, and by the way, who the, 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 the entity was in charge of actually blocking these sites are, can be sometimes the internet providers. So often the sites that are being blocked are sites that are used for illegal download of movies, films, TV series. Okay, so alongside the Ministry of Communication and the internet providers, we also have the Israeli Internet Association. Now the Internet Association is in charge of registering um, domain names, of giving the domain for people who want to create their own websites. The association is mostly concerned with um, teaching people about internet and about the ability and about the things that they can use the internet for their own uh, benefit and um, they're trying to I guess I guess you can call it they're trying to create some sort of uh, of programs of digital literacy trying to trying to get people to understand what how it can make the most out of the internet they organize conferences they organize lectures for the public they distribute material so they're practically trying to inform the public about the internet. So why do we really need this digital right movement? It seems that everything is pretty much okay. Well, not so much. So the Israeli digital right movement began the establishment somewhere around 2009. And it started its activities mainly surrounding the creation of the biometric database. And I will tell you a bit more about it later. And um, it eventually became an official NGO in 2011. And this is their declaration of a principle. Okay? The movement is about protecting and promoting individual and community rights in the digital age. The movement handles privacy rights, freedom of speech, freedom of equality, consumer rights, etc., and also acts upon possible breaches caused by the use of information technology. The movement understands and acknowledges the power of technology to, on one hand, promote rights and, on the other, violate them. The movement's prime goal is to be center of knowledge at those exact junctures where technology and rights meet. The movement also declares itself to be the equivalent to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So in that sense, they resemble the Internet Israeli Association because they're also um, committed to maintaining an open, free internet without any restrictions. But they are much more political in the sense that they are willing to take part in activities in order to shape the policy of internet, uh, the policy of internet governance, and to advocate for people's rights online. So looking at the activities of the Israeli digital right movement over the last couple of years, they focused mainly on two rights the right to privacy and freedom of expression. These are their main two rights, and I will explain to you a little bit about the biometric database and the freedom of expression that's left. But I'd just like to point out that beside of dealing with the biometric database, we can see that they are trying to advocate the right for privacy in many different uh, subjects. For example, the dog application, which is a really nice thing. It is an application created by Google, used by the Ministry of Agriculture in Israel, and the intent be behind creating this application was to create a database of dogs and dog owners in Israel. Unfortunately, it turned out that you can retrieve information from this application about the dog, about the people who own the dog, the dog owners. You can retrieve personal information such as their phone numbers, their home addresses, and since some of them are politicians and public figures, it makes the information even more, the release of information even more crucial. And they're also dealing with the fact that in many times in court verdicts, um, there is private information which can be revealed quite easily. And they're also advocating for um, the smart cards. We have smart cards in Israel for public transportation. And it turned out to be that there is the information stored on the smart card is being preserved for unlimited time. So for years and years, the, public, the Ministry of Transportation is actually collecting information about people's habits when they use the public transportation. They also uh, find out, and, and the last thing which I'd like to point out, and this especially relevant during this, before this coming election, is the bingo system. The bingo system 
is an app created, for, uh, created by the political parties in Israel. What this app is, can do is, is like this. People who are sent to oversee what's going on in the ballots during election day can, re can use this app in order to report back to the parties, to their parties, about who is coming to vote and when. Okay? So this information, combined with the information people have usually during the election day of um, how many ballots are still in the ballot boxes, can give the parties information about the preferences of their voters. They used it in the last election. This is a very complicated math. I mean, it's combining two sets of completely different uh, information. They used it in the previous election. They did, not did, they did not do the combination in the previous elections. It's, I'm still waiting to see what will happen in this coming election, whether some people will actually try to combine between those, between those two different sets of information in order to retrieve information about the voters' preferences. And last, we have the biometric database. As for the freedom of expression in this uh, particular right, what we're seeing is that the movement is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of SLAP. SLAP is strategic lawsuit against public participation. SLAP is be usually being issued when somebody is upset from criticism someone else published on him, and in order to um, intimidate him, he sues him, to, he takes him to court. Now, the entire intention is to intimidate and to censor the, the man who published the criticism. But it serves as a great way to silence criticism and opposition. And, um, and while it is not a new phenomena, and journalists suffer it from it for a long time, because of the internet today, every citizen can do it also, can publish online criticism. But what happened when somebody is upset from this criticism? It could be a politician. It could be a business person. It could be even a restaurant which you published a bad criticism about it. They can sue you back. And if you're a citizen and you don't have the money, and you don't have the resources to handle such lawsuit, you are in a problem. So the IDRM offers free uh, clinic, free, uh, free um, um, legal consult for these people, and they are represented by the clinic in court. And I will explain how it evolved later on. So, going back to the first case, the right to privacy, the biometric database. Okay, so, some history. Back in 2001, the Israeli government started to talk about, they started to talk about issuing smart documents. By that time, nobody talked about creating a biometric database. And then, in a surprising turn of events, which I can, st I can tell you that we're st people are still, st are still trying to figure this out, Somewhere in 2008, the government began discussing the concept of creating a biometric database, an obligatory biometric database. What does it actually mean? It, mean, it means that on your ID card, which is a smart ID card, you have your fingerprints and your facial features. And these details will also be stored in a different database. Of course, it will be in an encrypted form, and it will be under the supervision of the Ministry of Interior. Now, according to the law, which eventually passed in 2009, for the first two years, this, was, this will only be a pilot. I mean, they will see how the database operates, they will see whether it is successful or not, and then after two years, they will decide whether to turn it into an obligatory database for the entire population of Israel. So throughout the entire stages of the legislation surrounding this biometric database, the IDRM tried to do its very best to oppose it. They basically raised two main claims. The first claim was that this is a violation of civil, li civil liberties. This is a way for the government to collect information about its entire population and to use this information without consent or knowledge of the citizens. So this is a violation of the right to privacy. The second claim they made was the danger of leaked information. What will happen, they say, so, uh, when, the when the database will be breached and the information will leak. The, the citizens' private information will be scattered all around. Citizens will be vulnerable. And what happens if it will fall into the wrong hands of criminals or even terrorists? I mean, they stressed out the point that by registering to the database, you will practically give up on your personal safety. They also raise up the claim that identity theft is not really a problem in Israel, 
but uh, they did not continue with this claim any further. So eventually the law passed, and, and you're probably wondering, okay, so if the law passed, why is it a success of the movement? The reason I still think, it is as, as, think of it as a success is because the movement managed to accomplish three main achievements. The first achievement is the amendment of the pilot plan. And this is a funny thing, because after the government created the pilot plan, the movement um, filed a lawsuit to court against the pilot plan. The court examined the pilot plan and ruled that there are some problems with it. There are no criteria to decide whether it will be successful or failure. There is no, um, there is no uh, 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 explanation why the database is even a necessity in Israel. And it seems, according to, uh, it seems the court said that the Ministry of Interior did not think of any other options other than biometric database. So eventually the court ruled that let the pilot continue. The pilot plan should be amended according to the criterion of the law the court gave to the Ministry of Interior. And then um, after two years' time, after the end of the pilot, the movement can refile, it, can refile its claims again, can file the lawsuit again to the court. And then after two years of the pilot, um, they will decide whether indeed the entire database can be, uh, can be abolished or can, can remain and become obligatory. <laughs> okay, so this was their first success. Their second success, following the pilot plan, one of the criteria to measure whether the pilot is really a success or not um, concerns the number of people that, actually can re that, that are actually registered in the database. So in order to, to determine whether the database is successful, more people should register to the database. So in order to encourage people to register to the database, the Ministry of Interior created a campaign, including the commercials I show you at the beginning of the lecture, okay? Encouraging people to issue smart documents, but, by not, by, but the commercial did not state in any way that by doing this you are also registering to the, to the biometric database. So again, the movement filed um, a lawsuit in court, and indeed, following this lawsuit, the, the Ministry of Interior had to modify its commercial so that it will, be, that will include full disclosure about the actual meaning of issuing smart documents. And the final stage, the final success, the final achievement, is trying to persuade the public not to register on the database. So what happens that following the campaign of the Ministry of Interior, the movement began a second campaign anti the campaign of the uh, Ministry of Interior. And let me just show you one of the <coughs> clips from the campaign. And I will explain also about the point of the finger. Yes, I know. So here we have some English subtitles. Okay. Shame for these ads, right? So what we're basically seeing here is a criminal sitting in a pub, in a pub, in a bar. He's looking for his next victim. And since by that time, the in this scenario, the biometric database was breached and the information leaked, in order to get his victim what he's doing, he has a special app. You'll soon see it. So he's taking his cell phone, taking her fingerprint, matches it. Find the details, yes, the details of the girl. And um, well, we can, you can speculate what will happen next, right? OK. So this commercial, yeah. That's controversial. controversial. It is controversial. I agree with you completely. It is a controversial commercial. So um, by the way, the commercial, they managed, they managed to create this commercial uh, after a, a creating a crowdfunding campaign. I mean, people actually donated money for the cause in order to create this commercial. And it is a controversial commercial. So when you're, when you're doing a commercial, when you're trying to convey a message to the public, it has to be 
persuasive, it has to be catchy, it has to be quick, because this is not politi this is not the political arena, this is not the court of law. You have to persuade the public very quickly. And they had several um, frames they could use when they tried to when 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 they thought about how to convince the how to persuade the public not to register to the database. They could point out to say that privacy is important. They could point out and say that privacy matters and this is why you should not register to the database. But what is the problem with, su with such a message? Well, first of all, people are getting used to the idea that privacy doesn't exist anymore, so what's the problem with that? Specifically, when we're talking about the Israeli society, I mean, of course, there are laws in Israel that protect privacy, but as a social norm, privacy is not widely accepted. I mean. People are more than willing to give up their own privacy uh, uh, for security reasons. They are getting used to v privacy violations from the government. And people are actually more willing to share their information online on social media, Israelis, in comparison to other people around the world. So convincing people that privacy matters is difficult. And convincing Israeli people that privacy matters is like impossible. It's even harder. So they had to use a different frame than privacy matters. Um, another frame they could use, and they didn't, was arguing that this entire biometric database is an anti-democratic law, which is an anti-democratic law. This is a violation of civil liberties. But what is the problem of framing it in this way? Well, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the political um, groups in Israel, but when you're starting to say something about n a non-democratic law, this is explicitly um, makes you turn into somebody from the left side of the political map, okay? If you're talking about rights and liberties, it means that you're from the left side of the political map. You're a leftist. So we're not going to, and the left, as you know, in Israel is not very strong. And we're not going to listen to any claims made by people from the left. So this is also not very convincing when it comes to the Israeli society. And you have to remember that following the model of the EFF, they are trying to create something which is relevant to the entire society. They wanted to create a coalition from the right and from the left in order to promote their agenda. So they decided to use this frame, according to which if you give your details to the biometric database, you're basically putting yourself in danger. You are risking your own personal safety, personal security, and even worse, do you really trust the government to protect you, to protect your privacy? This also resonates with another, another very strong frame of reference in Israel that people are gradually uh, do, not, do not trust the government. They do not trust the government to, um, to, to, to protect their interests and they do not trust the government to protect their private information. So seriously, uh, the, uh, there is another commercial in which the anchor said, Seriously, do you really trust the Israeli government to protect your privacy? If you want to protect your privacy, please do not register to the database. This is the greatest thing you can do. And as for the finger, okay, which is also a really nice uh, slogan, they did it on stickers. Um, in order to register to the database, you have to give them your, this finger for the scanner. And this is the finger that they're giving to the biometric database. And finally, um, and another cool project they did was they created, mm, I don't know what's wrong. You cannot see that. That's a shame. Well, hmm? what? <laughs> yeah, somebody's, a good one. Somebody's watching. Well, they did a project in which they map all the countries around the world to see where there is an obligatory um, biometric database and where there isn't. So according, I, I wish you could see the map because it's really nice visual way to present it. But according to the map, in countries such as the US, Canada, uh, France, and the UK, uh, the biometric database uh, was a suggestion, but eventually it was rejected. I mean, they voted against it in every possible way. Uh, in India, there is still a biometric database, but it's compulsory. You don't have to join it at that point. However, where you do have uh, places where biometric database is compulsory is places like, um, okay, I have to see it, I have to get it right because I don't want to offend any of the other countries. Okay, um, okay, in France it is rejected as you can see. 
No, 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 no. <laughs> Germany, why do you say Germany? No, Germany, compulsory national ID card, which is okay. Okay, it's not database, it's not a bi biometric database, it's India, it's not compulsory. It is compulsory in Indonesia, okay, it is in, in Iraq, in, in Israel it's still not like, uh, where else do we have it? Um, I think also Pakistan, I'm not sure about it. Okay, uh, New Zealand was rejected also. Pakistan, National Biometric Database, compulsory. Um, so, this gives you an idea why, what is the movement is also trying to advocate. Uh, the Netherlands, it was rejected. Ukraine, ah, uh, no, 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 sorry. Uh, no, compulsory only the national ID card, not the biometric database. Well, the biometric database is basically in all the, demo, the great democratic uh, countries, it is rejected. It is only compulsory in, let's say, non so democratic countries. Okay. Okay. So, the public campaign actually continues these days. And the end of the pilot stage will only be uh, this, uh, this summer, summer of 2015. And then we can see whether the movement actually managed to do the impossible and stop the biometric database completely or not. So it's still left to be seen whether it is will be a success eventually. Okay, going to another, and now this is a shorter story, this is the freedom of expression and the slap suit. But it also begins in a, with a funny story. Okay, so 2013, the Israeli Internet Association arrange a conference, a lecture, for people to participate. And in the conference, it presented a, a person named Enav Gennad Galili, and which presented herself as an expert, an expert in, on cyber issues, specifically issues such as the dark net or the deep web. So the uh, lecture lasted for several hours, and um, as it turned out to be, the lecture was filled with mistakes and fundamental inaccuracies. Serious mistakes. So let me just so show you a clip of the lecture. Um, please forgive the language. I did not put it out like this, but this was the only one I could find with English subtitles. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know much about technical issues, same as I, because I don't know much, it took me a while to understand what was wrong with the lecture, but those of you who do understand something can actually enjoy some of the things she's saying. <laughs> For example, one, this is a, by the way, uh, this is a, a satiric slide. This is a slide made as a joke somewhere around online, you can find it. And she used it to explain the seven layers of the deep web. By the way, on the se in the seventh layer, you can also find Atlantis. <laughs> she actually said it. Atlantis is somewhere in the seventh layer. Um, layer number three, I mean, she basically rambles on and on and on and saying some really, really not so smart things. Okay. <laughs> um, so what happened was that the lecture was posted online Okay, I'm glad that you're laughing because somebody actually has understand. Oh, this is a great stuff. This is saying this is coming from the fantasy world of Dragon Lake. Okay, so yes, she said a lot of stupid things and I'm closing this presentation. It's really a funny one if you want to see it uh, later on. Okay, so the lecture was posted online and of course people began to criticize the lecture and to post their own criticism about what she said. And it was, it, at, at that point it was just a joke. But what happened afterwards, and this is where the part when it's starting to get serious, that Enav Gennad Galili actually decided to sue 25 people that published criticism on her online. And <coughs> most of these people were really ordinary citizens, simply publishing their criticism in the most informative way. So what is left to do? And what happened is, was that the Israeli digital rights movement decided that this is slap. And so let's try to defend the people who were persecuted by Enav Gennad Galili. 
So they started the Head Start campaign to, again, to raise some money, crowdfunding campaign, and it was really, really successful. I mean, this is the Sama English Sama Hebrew page, yes? It was really, really successful. They managed to uh, eventually raise the double the sum they thought they could, uh, they, 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 they thought to, to, to arrange. I mean, they wanted to arrange something like 30,000 shekels. They managed to raise 65,000 shekels. So in the rest of their money, what they decided to do was to create a free clinic for future slaps. So if any citizens in Israel will suffer from a slap, they can approach the clinic and the clinic will give him, will, re, will give him the, the, the legal defense he needs in court. And this is a great thing because just recently they, they um, published their first case. Their first case is a social activist who posted in his Facebook page critics, uh, criticism against, um, against a business project in his own city. He claimed the people that are involved in this project are uh, corrupted, and of course they sued him, and the clinic volunteered to protect him in court. And this is a really great thing from, the, uh, from that perspective. Now, as for the Galili case, there isn't a ruling yet, but the way I see it, the main achievement was able, it was the manage that they, they created a free clinic. This is, this is a great achievement in terms of preserving freedom of speech in the Israeli society. Okay, so taking everything together, what do we learn from this case of the Israeli judicial right movement? Well, to begin, we are looking at, the, at least at the beginning of new symbolic boundaries. Regarding the right to privacy on the one hand and freedom of speech on the other hand. I mean, when it comes to right to privacy, apparently now it's the right to your, it's the right to safety, to personal safety. And when it comes to freedom of speech, according to what they're trying to do, freedom of speech is not just saying that you can express your opinion, but it also means that you can criticize others. You can criticize politicians. You can criticize businessmen. You can criticize uh, the government. You can criticize whoever you want. And in that sense, they are really trying to create to better, to, to, to encourage people to become better citizens. I mean, go on there. Publish what you feel is the right thing to do. Stand up for your government. Um, when somebody is doing something wrong, you should write something about it online. So this is a great thing. And looking at the, 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 their achievement, <coughs> I can say that there, I, I can, for now I can recognize three main conditions that manage, that able, able the movement to achieve some success. First of all, they operate in three arenas. I mean, the politicians and court and of course the public. When it comes to the public, um, by the way, this is an important, the, the first condition, it's an important condition because I think James Lucy said it last semester when he was here, he mentioned the fact that we are often being exposed only to the public part of all these campaigns. And we cannot, we shouldn't forget that, 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 that there are some really, that some really political and judicial efforts are, are being made behind the scenes and we, not, and we do not usually see these efforts but this, this is part of every successful campaign there is. Second, when it comes to engaging the, the, the public, they try to do so, but they're trying to maintain a low-key activism. This is not slacktivism. It's not just like <coughs> clicking and like and that's it. No, they're actually asking people to <coughs> donate money, which is probably the easiest form of activism for people in some way. Like, okay, I will just donate like 25 shekels, which is probably to $5, something like that. And that's the end of the story. I did something. They make the, the, the public feel that he's actually being involved. And finally, and it took them some time to do that, trying to take over the public discourse in the mediated public sphere, trying to promote their agenda, on mainstream media, online media. This is something they did not do at the beginning. They only started doing it at the last year and a half. And, and it, it, it's, it's working pretty good for them. Um, and what bothers me about the movement, and this will be the, um, the final topic in my lecture, and this also goes back to your, <laughs> to your introduction about the political aspect. What bothers me about the movement is the fact that the movement is trying to all the time preserve some sort of neutrality. They are not part of the political, they are not in the right uh, uh, wing, they are not left, they are somewhere in the middle. What may be, I mean, 
what might be the problem of such a positioning in the Israeli society? Now, in order for you to understand the problematic aspect of this, I'm taking you back to the last summer in Israel. I don't know how many of you know, but during the last summer, there was another escalation of the conflict between Israel and Hamas. And this time, it was a longer conflict. It lasted two months. Um, there were many casualties on both sides. But what was really disturbing during this time was something that <coughs> occurred in the Israeli society. People published online their criticism against this operation. Some of these critiques were moderate and constructive. Some of these critiques were very offensive and very hurtful. Some of their critiques were uh, against the Israeli state. Some of them were against the Israeli army. But what happened was that following the people that actually published their critiques online began to suffer from the consequences of publishing their critiques. Um, for example, some people were suspended from their working place. Others were fired. Some state, uh, some um, state institutions, some universities even published um, a recommendation to their employees and to their students, please do not publish online your criticism against the war if it can be perceived as too radical. This is a new phenomenon in the Israeli society. This is a whole new different way of limiting freedom of speech and listen, it got nothing to do with the government. It got everything to do with the social media and the atmosphere in Israel. Now, what I expected was that during this time, the movement will make some sort of a claim, stating that criticism online is okay. People can publish their criticism. People should not suffer for using their freedom of speech in order to criticize others. But the movement did not do that. Why the movement did not do that, I still don't have the answer, and I will find out eventually the answer after finishing interviewing people. Um, but what concerns me is the fact that in Israel, because of the political situation, it seems to be a little bit unreasonable to continue with this neutral position because at some point, and unfortunately this day will come, when the movement will have to decide whether it is advocating for the digital rights of the entire Israeli population or only of those really small sectors inside this, the Israeli population. So what I want to know are, what are the boundaries of this, of this boundary? So thank you for listening. And again, for any suggestions and comments and questions, this is my email and the floor is yours now. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have very <coughs> limited knowledge about the yeah, I know. Sociopolitical uh, landscape in Israel. But something that is striking in, in even in the both ads mm -hmm. from two sides for me was that it seems that there's a f grand narrative about security That's right. as the priority. That's and right. both sides try <coughs> to tap into that to make their argument. And probably that's why, and I know you, you, you know better. Uh, in cases that are controversial and connecting to the broader so security issue of society, this movement does not want to take part. For example, when you're talking about a war yeah. or a conflict, uh, because it has been highly tied to the security of people, specifically by this powerful right wing. Yeah. So, uh, and if you use the security as a frame that you try to convince people to participate, you do not want to go to that you don't want to use it against yourself because if you start moving in that direction, it might hurt you. Now, I agree with you that using the security frame, unfortunately, is the best frame in Israel. It works every time. And this is why they do it when it comes to the biometric database. When it, but when it comes to um, freedom of speech online, especially during war times, there is no security aspect in that. I mean, in that sense, people should be able to express their opinions freely without any restrictions, and even if their opinions are hurtful and offensive and disturbing, they still should have the right to do so. I mean, when you're looking at it from the point of your freedom of speech. So it was okay, I mean, to criticize people who are um, falsing, who are publishing false information online like Enav Gennad Galili did, but it is not okay to protect people who are stating their opinions. 
it might be problematic. I agree with you, especially dur during this last summer. This was like, somebody claimed it, it was two months of insanity in Israel. Seriously, people completely lost their mind during these two months. I know I've been there. I'm still suffering from the consequences of being there in the last summer. And, um, and at that point, it seemed that the Israeli society lost its, uh, lost its way. Like, suddenly we forgot that we're a democracy. And in democracy, people should be allowed to speak up their minds. And yes, it might have damaged the, 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 the movement in the long run. I, I understand why they didn't do that. I mean, it might have damaged them in the long run, especially when they're still fighting for the biometric database, which is, by all means, poses a much greater threat to the Israeli democracy, okay? But still, I, I'm, I can't help to think about the future. What will happen in the next escalation, which will probably happen in six months' time from now? Yeah. Yes, it's fine. So I have, I have two uh, sort of comments slash questions. So one, I guess, I don't know, this is sort of for you to kind of think about or maybe answer, but I think so that, you know, specifically, if I remember correctly, the people who got fired for posting stuff during the war, it was more like around hate speech. So it was individuals who were like working in, in service, in customer service capacities and, and posted hate speech type of stuff that is sort of tricky in Israel. Is it, I mean, the approach is not as liberal as it is in America. It's that's closer right. to the European scale of things as far as hate speech goes. And so maybe that's sort of because, because the approach is not exactly as liberal as in America, but closer to the European model, they didn't want to, you know, get into that as, mm -hmm. as a more yeah. um, widely accepted uh, movement because it really hate speech is sort of more, you know. Yeah, but how do you, how do you find hate speech? I mean, even in this, in, even when you're looking at the concept of hate speech, I mean, people like publish three words and is this considered to be a hate speech and should they suffer the consequences from like publishing three words? I mean, losing their job, this is. Yeah, I mean, obviously. Yeah, it, it's a problem. I agree with you. This is something to, to think about. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it goes to the broader umbrella of like hate speech in Israel. That's right. That's right. Of, um, and, and by the way, they only, it only affected people that uh, published hate speech against the Israelis. I mean, when people criticized the Palestinians, they used hate speech against the Palestinians, nothing happened to them. So it goes both. It has to go. If we're doing the hate speech, it has to go both ways. Yeah. Um, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing that I was thinking is. As far as so defining sort of the scope of, of what the, this movement does, are they advocating for, for full-on rights, meaning legal definitions of rights, as in, you know, you have a right, so someone else has a duty to provide for you to have that, oh. that absolute right? Oh, or, more like a, or more like a privilege, like fair use, you know, thinking like the legal scholar that I am. Yeah, yeah, I so know. fair use is not a right, it's, it's more like a privilege. So it's not an absolute right that you have to use fair use, but it's more like, you know, it's 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 a little bit more defined in scope. It's not like the right to you know not get. Uh, I don't know. This is interesting. This is like interesting. But this is a distinction that the movement has not been doing so far, and this is a distinction I think that we will have to do in the future. I mean, it it since it's really it's the beginning the, of the beginning of the beginning of the movement. I do not know whether what do they achieve what do they aim to achieve in the future. But this is the distinction that for now it is off the table. I believe it will be a problem. It, a problem, an issue, a challenge in the future. Okay, thank you. Yes, hi. hi. Thank you so much, super interesting talk. Thank you. I have two questions. The first one is uh, going back to the summer and yeah. all the attacks of people who express criticism. Mm -hmm. What kind of other new channels or ways that um, those who are critical of the war efforts found to express you know, their thoughts? If what other the news channels? channels? What are the just, like, ways or channels that they use like, for resisting this kind oh, of attacks? Oh, Facebook. They posted everything on Facebook pages. Shut down in the local yeah, I mean, the Facebook did not, I mean, their pages did not shut down. I mean, what happened was that people saw what they posted online and then they informed their people at work and they tweeted and. and, tweeted and they went from like bottom up to. Exactly. Top, as opposed to like top down systematic. That's right. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. And so they were not surveilling the posts. Hmm? They, were, they were not surveilling the posts to see who no, no, is posting. No, 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 no. They people. were not surveilling the posts. It was not like. I mean, as far as I know, they were not surveilling the posts. I mean, this is. It takes too much effort, and I don't think anybody will do that. Okay. It's like a sporadic yeah. effort. Yeah. 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 They could like continue further, you know, depending on the political climate, people will just start reporting. On exactly. Yeah. And uh, my second question was kind of bringing Israel back into the broader, I don't know, cases of digital activism because you yeah. started out with this, you know, bigger theoretical framework. Yeah. I know it's one of the cases. How do you position the kind of bigger landscape? 
in comparison to other democracies or non-democracies? Like, how do you sort of see it? You know, based on your existing findings. Okay, this is a, oh yeah, this is a difficult question. This is actually the the question I'm thinking about when I'm trying to analyze now the the next cases I have online. Um, I don't know yet. I mean, I don't have an answer for that question either. This is a, one of the things that I'm thinking about it, conceptualizing it, how to compare Israel because Israel is so different from other democracies. How can you even compare? I mean, every democracy has its own problems, its own issues, its own limitations. I know this is also. Uh, um, uh, this is also one of the things that I'm thinking of when, when doing something comparative. I think I will focus on the meaning of the right and not necessarily, for, I will start from focusing on the meaning of the right in the eyes of the activists. And from that, moving slowly to understand the bigger frame. But still, this is, as I said. Exactly. That's right. This is, this is what I'm currently thinking of. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. We are going to close at 1 o'clock. Okay, that's a fine meeting. <laughs> so the Netanyahu speech will come later. <laughs> after March 3rd. Really? No, no questions about Netanyahu's speech, about the future of the political system, about the elections in Israel? <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me here.